I am Andrus Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. And I'm about to leave in uh, 11 days on a journey from Lithuania to Onianta, New York, to attend the Let Me Think scholarship workshop led by Joshua Myers. Well, there'll be 20 of us. We had our first Zoom meeting. And there I, I saw uh, Ren Shin Li, who is an advisor who will be working with us. And uh, she struck me as a person I'd like to interact with, get advice from. So this is the first in a series, maybe every week, that I will do to document what I'm learning in this uh, phase two of Math for Wisdom. If you've followed this last year, you've seen that what was a fantasy in my mind has become substantially but microscopically real. We have videos, we have participants, and uh, now phase two, we're reaching out. But this is a very special uh, video because uh, Ran Shin Li cracks me like a walnut. She she uh, is the one who gets me to open out. You can see I'm excited. Uh, so I have uh, recorded interviews with others about their relationship with truth. And after doing this, I realized this is about my relationship with truth, with absolute truth an absolute view. Uh, very intense. So not surprising that my computer crashed, uh, overwhelmed, I think, within the first few minutes. Uh, that has been lost. Uh, it uh, will crash again. Uh, that has not been a problem. So please uh, welcome Renshin Li. Okay, so I apologize, and my computer apologizes. We crashed, and uh, Renshin, you are saying that um, you are saying uh, that uh, you're you're not um, also completely aware of what's going on. But that uh, are you going to be at the? Um, at, you're not going to be at New York, or are you going to be there? It depends. Um, Joshua's still working out exactly like what part it would be good to have me for. Okay. And so, um, and I have to figure out whether it works for my schedule, but mm -hmm. I would like to, I would like to be there for some of the time. Oh, good. Then I, I would like to also. <laughs> um, so I, I, we, I didn't get to hear, um, you were saying um, about math. I mean, something I heard the maple. word math, but maybe it was... Maple, um, actually. I think I said maple. Um, what does maple, maple mean? Is that... Uh... Maple is short for uh, Monastic Academy for the Preservation of Life on Earth. It's just, a, oh. Oh, it's that's just nice. an acronym. It's an acronym maple. For, maple, for Monastic Academy. I was just saying that um, I've been living here for four years. And so, oh. um, you know, and I consider this to be a sort of investigatory community, but sure. also before my time here... I was part of the rationalist community in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. and they're, they're, they're another sort of investigatory community, especially around this topic of AI. AI. So maybe I will um, just, go, you know, just for the context of the conversation, uh, just give, go th run through the questions I have. I hope this doesn't yes. crash my computer, but we'll, <laughs> I want to try again. Let's see. Uh, okay. Share. And then... Uh, Oh, yeah, this is it. Okay, I hope. Ta -da. Do you see my questions? Yes, I see them. Okay, so the it's the top ones that matter. So what, and I'll maybe explain this a bit, but like, what can awareness of the landscape of truth contribute to a network of investigatory communities? So maybe uh, to decode that. Uh, so I kind of figured out... Um, you know, ever since childhood, I wanted to know everything, apply that knowledge usefully. And so I have this language of cognitive frameworks after 40 years of, you know, it's a very lonely thing, but after working on that. And in talking to others, I just kind of realized like, uh, well, so it was about wisdom, a language of wisdom. And then for others to validate it, I thought, well, I have a PhD in math. You know, if I could show that it exists in math, you know, that would be, uh, that would impress people. So that's math for wisdom. But it turns out it's really about absolute truth. So it's an investigatory community for absolute truth, which is a huge taboo in our times. This idea, oh, like, although like 
uh, normal people kind of accept what it probably is. You know, we don't know anything about it. But academics are, have it really rooted out. Like, you know, they're just very much like it's a non-thing. You know, it's bad to think about it. So I'm kind of uh, up against that. But the deal is, is that uh, uh, in nurturing this tiny community, it turns out that there's people who completely don't see this whole concept. Um, there's uh, people who, but basically everyone has a different relationship with truth. So I started asking, and like I, I did a nice video, Welcome for to Math for Wisdom, where it's basically 10 participants all or eight participants all have their different relationships with truth. So then I realized, well, but there could be a landscape of truth, you know, how it all fits together. Then that'd be very nice. So one is that that's interesting to me uh, to kind of see, well, how can we relate? And then, then absolute truth will become kind of relevant again. But then the next thing is that, okay, so we're studying scholarship uh, communities. And so Math for Wisdom is one of them. But I think this would all be meaningful in the context of a network of investigatory communities. And in the first meeting we had with Joshua online, where you were and I got to see you, that resonated with somebody, maybe with Anya, uh, but uh, that resonated, this idea of a network of communities so that we don't have to be so strong on our own, but that we could be in a supportive uh, ecosystem where we help each other out, we share energy. So, okay, so could a landscape of truth, you know, be a way for these network, you know, for these investigative communities to understand each other? Like you, you're giving two examples, the rationalists, you know, and then this monastic community, they probably sit on different parts of that landscape. And so that would help me like reach out to groups. Uh, that'd give me kind of excuse. It'd give me excuse to learn. It would kind of understand like, you know, who do I resonate with? Who do I not resonate with? But what can we do about that? And so maybe just to run through these questions. So it's kind of like three categories. So what are the relationships that people have with truth to spell out that landscape? How can those under relationships be understood in terms of a landscape of truth? And what is the place of absolute truth within that landscape of truth? So I've started kind of drawing pictures, but but that's the whole deal. Then on the other end, what investigatory communities are there? So that's something you know about. Uh, what are the goals and approaches of these investigatory communities? How can investigatory communities be understood in terms of the landscape of truth? How do and how could investigatory communities work together? And how could the landscape of truth help investigatory communities work together? So those are the two things I'm trying to connect. And then for me personally, like who cares about absolute truth and why? So if I want to find participants and sponsors in my community, you know, it's just not clear. Um, I have some getting some thoughts on that, but who cares about wisdom and why now in the past? What concepts and activities can ground a shared language of wisdom? What concepts and activities do not help? I have experience with that <laughs> and why? And uh, what roles could math for wisdom play within a network of learning communities? So I don't know if we need to, to see that. Maybe if I can bring it up later, but I just want to see you big. So I'll reduce that. Yeah, that's a very helpful list of questions. I actually do have something I want to speak to about, about that, especially why. Why do some people find themselves really drawn to seeking absolute truth? Mm -hmm. um, and kind of why is it so seemingly rare mm -hmm. that people are really drawn? in that direction. Um, from what I can tell, and from my own experience and seeing others in this space, it does require a certain level of desperation. There's a kind of like really strong internal drive that for some reason, you just like kind of have to swat away every other distraction, everything that isn't <laughs> this absolute truth. And that takes so much effort that um, and it, it's just this like energy that like moves someone just straight in that direction without sometimes you get lost for a while right like sometimes you like go off the path yeah and, like, you know spend years of your life doing something else but then you come back to it and you're like whoa what was I what was I do I forgot the most important thing um, right. is this like search and so Having that, some, as far as I can tell, the word desperation is a good, a good characteristic of like someone who seeks the truth. I've um, never heard that before. So you know, <laughs> of course, I'm wondering. Okay, so what? <laughs> am I so desperate? You know, 
<laughs> but, um, but well, or driven, so that's or a big determined. Question. Pardon? Determination. Determination might be another way of putting it. Well, I mean, for me, and this is kind of like uh, maybe a cultural thing, but like, so this notion of God in the sense that like, you know, like whatever, you know, whatever's going to be, but like this notion that there's like a radically, uh, there's a radically different perspective that's total and that's, uh, you know, and that's somehow, uh, you know, founded and somehow... And what's our relationship like with regard to a perspective like that? So it's not so much about like, is there a God? But like, well, what could we know about that perspective? You know, what would it be like to sit in God's lap, let's say, right? And see everything from God's point of view. So, and I think the desperation to think like, that is relevant. And that's not how things are organized in life, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, so one of the things I learned, I had like a 12 years of experience uh, organizing independent thinkers. I probably sent you a link about that. I don't know if you had a chance to look, but uh, Minshu saw this um, because I'm an independent thinker. So I thought uh, this was in, I, you know, in America, I could try to make a living working part time. But I moved to Lithuania, the land of my heritage around 97, and that was a poor country. So I thought I need to start a business, let's say. So I thought the internet was just available. So I thought I'll start a business serving independent thinkers, you know, but they didn't have any, you know, they're cheap. So they don't have any money, but I thought, okay, I'll give free service, but it'll organize like a network. And then we'll get used to helping each other working for free. It'll become, it turns out it's very easy to organize teams for knowledge work, you know, because, and then you have this network that can get you maybe work, you don't have to go looking for work, you know, the work can kind of find you. So it almost worked, but I went bankrupt. You know, we had like different clients and stuff. It was a very interesting model. So uh, so the experience there, like it turned out we ended up having a culture, like almost like a civilization, you know. But um, one of the things in that culture was that um, people who accommodate each other easily, they end up in the center. People who want like deep agreement, they don't end up in the center. <laughs> you know, like so, so if they're not in the center, they end up everywhere else. You know, so you have like everybody in the periphery. You could be in positions of power or you could be, you know, homeless, but you're gonna be in you're gonna be in the periphery wherever you are. Like, but there's this potential for a network of the periphery. And so it's the culture of the periphery. And the idea is like, well, what if we gave resources out to the people in the periphery who are good at sharing resources? let's say, right? So that whole kind of like economics, a lot of economic angles, like how do you try to make this work? Uh, now it's, I don't have the debts, so now it's simpler because, you know, I had growing debts. They grew up like 100, uh, over the course of 12 years, they grew to about $130,000. And then at just a certain point, just kind of had to give up. But um, now without debts, and now it's more selfish. Back then it's like, oh, I'm going to help anybody. No, now it's like, it's about me. Like I'm the independent thinker. <laughs> like So, you know, I'm 58, like my life is ending. It's very, you know, it's like, man, I got to, you know, it'll be kind of funny being in this workshop, you know, with 20 year olds and, you know, 30 year olds. <laughs> yeah, It's right. just like a different, you know, I mean. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, like I, I my life is not, op you know, it's not the opening up stage, like where you say, like, you're allowed to go on tangents. It's like, no, like I have to land my plane, you know, like mm -hmm. that's at least how it feels, you know. So um, I kind of I kind of was on a tangent, but um, no, I guess maybe just we were. Oh, this was about God, I think. Uh, and I do have a tight. So I from childhood, I have like this cold relationship with God. I cut a deal with God. I said, look. I want to know everything. I was like six years old. I said, I want to know everything because, you know, like that's the most I could do with my life. But that's dangerous. You know, it could go real wrong. <laughs> so yeah. I go, you know, that's kind of stepping into God's territory. So I go, well, I go to God and say, look, I offer this, you know, that uh, please um, give me the freedom to think whatever I need to think. You know, maybe you're good. Maybe you're not good. Maybe you exist. Maybe you don't, you know, but but I'll always believe in you. You know, it doesn't matter what I know. Like I kind of like sold my soul to God, you know, like to, to say, look, like. And so I didn't, you know, that seemed satisfactory, you know, and then I go, well, OK, maybe I need a sign. And then I very quickly go, no, no, no. Like uh, signs are problematic. You know, because then you're dependent on the sign. Like, so I just go, no, no, no. Uh, the sign is that you didn't give me a sign. If you want to, you'll always give me a sign, right? Like, so just got, this shows like as a six-year-old child, like I was I, like, you know, so what was his desperation? You know, like what was this? Uh, 
And I grew up like not really being understood by anybody, maybe just to say a little bit more like my like I was a very good kid. But my mother, when I was like 13 or so, she looked at a Newsweek article. And she goes, they had a special on mental health. <laughs> so they had a little spectrum, you know, where you are on the spectrum. She goes, see this category? It's called the functionally sane. <laughs> you know, so it's like the 5%, like they brush their teeth. You know, but like no one understands what's going on with them. I like, but they function. <laughs> she goes, "Is that like, is that you?" <laughs> no, and I'm like, oh, it's okay, like whatever, you know. But but like that's my mother. <laughs> like now you just think about like how many people could have their mother say that. <laughs> so it just shows like what a strong person I was. I think like to be able to have that relationship with my mother, I think right. Like it means I'm a pretty tough guy. So so um. This is a little bit about me, right? But, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. So, so I guess so. Then the, you see my questions. You see what I'm trying to do. You can kind of tell, like, uh, I'm trying to make the most of this opportunity. This is special. Uh, I've had, you know, I don't know. I mean, lots of times these things in my life seem, oh, that's a great opportunity. This is the opportunity where, and then, like, I get kicked out. You know, like lots of things. Uh, but I think what I think this is all great. Like one of the things that was very good about Joshua, he allowed me, you know, because I, I always try to maximize these things, but I wanted to spend an extra time, you know, in the U.S. I haven't been in the U.S. for 10 years. So I thought there are people I want to meet, you know, like that I'm working with in our small group. Uh, John Harland is an old friend and we meet by Zoom once a week and we kind of work in parallel on investigations and Kirby Erner is in Portland. I've never met him. And he corresponds in my discussion group um, for, and he's my foil. Like he, he's the one who doesn't see absolute truth. Like he's got a bachelor's in philosophy. He just doesn't see it. You know, kind of thing just does, he thinks like that if he ignores it, it'll go away. <laughs> so, so it was, I mean, so that was the, so he's a great because he's, he hangs in there with me. You're really great. So I wanted to get to know him. So the idea is, so anyway, so Joshua allowed me to set up the tickets so that I'll be like an extra five weeks, mm -hmm. you know, which shows like either he's naive or he's just very nice or like, you know, because I've been kicked, I've been really making requests like that. You know, I've been really, uh, I've been, you know, it does not be often. Joshua, Joshua is a very sensible person. Yeah. He's sensible. He's reasonable. He did a good job also with the first meeting, I thought, like as a leader, like he's younger than me, you know, by, by a lot. Yeah. And so I kind of told him like, what well, just in terms of a leader, like my experiences as a young leader, like, you know, you think it should be kind of like, well, democratic and just like, that's not going to work, you know, like, mm -hmm. the more clearly you lead, the more you give people a chance to also be doing what they want to be doing, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus yeah. says, like, you know, they don't go through the door, like they're just stepping in the door. <laughs> Like so if you go through the door, other people can go through the door, right? Yeah. But if you just stand in the door, no one can go through the door. So don't be the one who stands in the door. I don't know if that makes sense, but it does. It does. Yeah. So what would be? What do you think is? Oh, so then I kind of think like I know what I want to do. I think a lot of people will be there more for the group experience. Mm -hmm. You know, like what can a group do? Mm -hmm. I don't have that need. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to contribute to the group, you know, so but th that means I don't really want to be in like the whole group political mm -hmm. sure. setup yeah. like it's not really relevant. I, I don't need to be a, a leader in the group. Um, and if I can find one or two people and I've already started contacting. So you're a person, you know, who's, you know, actually I contact said, write to the people, you know, I'm starting to work who I can work with ahead of time and then who, you know, I'd like to have touch with afterwards. And if I find like one or two or three people, that'll be a huge success. If I don't, yeah. I don't. So yeah, that's yeah I think, I think um, it'd be great to, if you have time in the U.S. Uh, for you to come visit us here in Vermont, uh -huh. it might, okay. might, might be nice. Um, uh, we are, there's some same pageness in terms uh -huh. of our mission or goals, just because we are also looking to create a network of communities. Mm -hmm. That's 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 one of our explicit aims. We're looking for, in particular, wisdom focused, probably more on the Buddhist sort of thing. I was wondering, I didn't know how to ask. But <laughs> yeah, more, on the, such... more, more like sort of based in certain principles or 
um so it's not strictly Buddhist, Buddhist like it's primarily I mean it's Buddhist oriented how do I how would I think of it like you know it's open to people non-Buddhists or how does it uh... yeah 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 I would say that certainly the people here at Maple they're not all Buddhists um and we do have people of different faiths mm -hmm. here as well and in terms of what the foundation of um of a of a community that we would want to branch off of mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to say exactly what that is um i don't want to label it as like oh you definitely have to be like a buddhist organization or something like that mm -hmm. but there is such a thing as absolute truth and mm -hmm. so anything that isn't serving that anything that isn't really in service to the absolute truth, um, you know, to, to me, to me, that would be going off, you know, going off path. It'd be going. And, it'd and, be... and may I ask, so that's clearly your personal view. And then the a question uh, is like, is that a general Buddhist position? Like, is that, uh, is that, uni you know, is that a universal Buddhist position or is that a, primarily the main position? Or... As far as, as far as I can tell, just based on the texts, the sutras, and mm -hmm. all the the Buddhist doctrine, yes, definitely. Okay, definitely, that's that is. And I never <laughs> thought of it that way. See, and I think that's one reason why it's so great to have this uh, reaching out these tentacles, because like it makes perfect sense, you know. But like I never would have presumed. I never would have thought about that way. You know, I never would have kind of like um, right. You know, but I think that that's very good to know. And so in a practical thing, like so this language of cognitive frameworks, um, one of the pinnacles uh, is uh, this thing I call the Eightfold Way. Um, because um, it, I first recognized it in thinking about the Buddha, Buddha's Eightfold, you know, the Noble Eightfold Way of the Buddha. Yeah. When I was uh, maybe a senior in college, you know, that was in 1986, let's say, right? So I noticed that. But then I, and see, because like, I have these basic structures like, OK, if you divide everything into two perspectives, that's like free will and fate, but more technically like opposites coexist and everything's the same. So that's just a recurring theme. Um, but that's for existence. You need that. Like so like for a chair to exist, you need to be able to say, oh, I'll ask a question. Does it exist? Does it not? But if it exists, it exists. You know, if it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. So you need like two points. So existence isn't the most basic thing. You need two points of view to have existence. But for learning you or your participation, you need three points of view. Like you take a stand, you follow through, you reflect. There's this learning cycle. For levels of knowledge, there's four levels of knowledge, like whether, what, how, why. So to try to convince people that this is, that's the way, that this is the actual truth, that this is the this is the eight. I'm sorry, uh, and my computer apologizes as well. Uh, something happened about a certificate or something that uh, got not, but I guess. Uh, uh, so I was just interrupting myself. I'm sorry. So just to say, like, so anyway, so these types of basic structures, they're all present in that Buddha's Eightfold Way, as far as I understand. The exact kind of structure, like, there's a Christian version. It's I call it Saint Peter's Keys to Heaven. So like, in le in one of the letters of Peter. Um. He talks about going from faith all the way to love. Like there's eight steps. So like if I think Buddha's if was like right intention is the beginning. Right view is oh, right view. Of the, the beginning. And the last one is right concentration. So like if you make all these connections, like saying, well, right view and faith is the same thing. You know, right concentration and uh, love is the same thing. You know, you go all through the middle steps. Like there's eight of them. I probably can remember them. But so they all kind of basically match up. But and more importantly than that, you see, it's like two copies of this uh, four levels of knowledge. And then, you know, the copies are related by these like division into two. And then inside, you know, if you take the first one and the last one, you have like the middle three, you know, and then they're up and down. So it turns out like our father, the prayer um, has that. You see the blessings on the mount has that uh, this thing in the there's actually three variants. So the Buddha Eightfold Way is one of those three variants. I could never find a Buddhist who could give me intuition on what do they mean, you know, by the, you know, like, what does that mean for them? Right, right. But like, I pray uh, the Lord's Prayer, our Father, I can explain exactly like what's going on. Uh, it's very uh, sensible. 
so that would be the kind of thing like if I got to be with Buddhists, I could ask like, well, you know, can we connect our languages? Yeah, let me ask you something. To me, it seems like you're good at finding these patterns, mm -hmm. patterns of um, what 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 is required for a reality, for like a right. a world to emerge, and also patterns between these different paths, these different uh, texts, mm -hmm. and finding. So is that pattern? Is that what you're referring to when we talk about? Truth, absolute truth. Yeah, I guess you see, I'm trying to instill, maybe that's just personal me, but in searching for absolute truth, like in wanting to know everything, what form does that take, right? So it led me like to those things, like the world is not real, you know, in terms of knowing everything, but like the limits of the imagination are real. When I study the limits of the imagination, you know, and in all different kinds of ways, but so those are the, like the kind of building blocks that let me, you know, be understanding, like, what's the prison of my mind? You know, so these are the chambers in the prison of my mind. So if I want to understand the, whoever put me in this prison, right? Like, if, if they want me to understand them, this is how I think it'll happen, you know, in the rational way, like not an, I'm not a mystic, so I don't want a mystical experience. I just want to I want to like a scientific way to do it. So if God wants me to scientifically understand like God, right? Like, so let me figure out like the, the limits to my life in the mental sense, let's say, right? Like, or whatever in the experiential sense, like in that type of sense, then I'll be able to understand. And actually it's, it gives it, well, it seems very successful. Like, you know I mean? From my point of view, it's very, it's very informative. So, but maybe what it says about, it says a lot about God in a certain sense, you know, you have to kind of also like do a lot of imagining from God's point of view, like, you know, the limits of the mind, um, do have to do empirical work on human experience, you know, like, like I've like maybe take hundred meaningful experiences in my life, study them, try to model them, etc. But I think maybe just to, to say like, like think of God as a state of contradiction. And think like, how could a non-contradictory world, and why would a non-contradictory world arise from a state of contradiction? You know, where all things are true. So, how would a world where not everything is true, you know, arise? This kind of fragile world that we kind of pretend exists. And so, these frameworks are kind of like layers that you need in order to build up this world. That's the that's the game. So. Okay, but but what is absolute truth? What are you are what are you referring to when you say that? Uh, well, so it would be like this godly view, like, so when God kind of like looks through us, or, you know, through various portals, let's say, or whatever, right, like, and they're basically all equivalent in the end, like any system would basically look the same, you know, somehow. Mm -hmm. So, but the idea is that, how is that, you know, this maximal view that kind of understand that is able to comprehend, it's like, how is that kind of like, um, just unfolding manifesting so it's through these types of structures basically like that's the language like so for physics you'd want the language of mathematics but like for uh, this is like before the okay. language of mathematics but like this is the language the, of, okay. the, of god or... <laughs> but let me stop you because it's interesting i want you to answer this question sure but the thing you respond with you're more describing the language one would use to talk about it right but what is it okay so the content maybe to say like what's the wisdom the wisdom um to speak in terms of content is that god does not have to be good so like or simply like life is not fair you see so in the buddhist we like they're suffering right? like, but the point so maybe this is like a jesus type of view like a little bit maybe different take on that like why oh, okay yeah you see like right. why is there suffering like why is there and the idea is that it's necessary for growth. Like, I mean, it's for eternal growth. Like if you want to have a, like, it's a choice. Do we want life or do we want eternal yeah. life? Life is the fact that God is good. So like God is beyond condition. Good is God within condition. You know, the structure of God is everything. The structure of good is slack. Life is the fact that they can be in harmony, you know, that God can be good. You know, so everywhere you see life, you see, oh, like the whole and the slack are in harmony. They all work together. But eternal life is understanding don't got to be that way. Like God is bigger. Like God is bigger than this, just this world, you know. So mm -hmm. God doesn't have to be good. And if you want to grow, you see, you need that because we're not going to grow if everything's hunky dory. You know, like we're going to grow if we see that um, that there's something not right, you know. And so mm -hmm. we have to be good. God doesn't have to be good. 
So that's kind of like it's very proactive, you know, in the sense of, hey, like we need to like what are we doing to be, you know, to be good to kind of like being God in conditions, because yeah. we have to be God in conditions. God is beyond conditions. So, mm. and you know, or there's this God within us, there's this God beyond us. How are they kind of creating this yeah. uh, fellowship? And yeah, yeah. So, so everything you're saying, everything you're saying, I'm tr it tracks. I'm like with Buddhas, like with you yeah. and with Buddha. and it's I can just, say there's with... there's four levels just to finish the thought. Like mm -hmm. sure. So that basic equation is like eternal life is on the spiritual level. But then it manifests structurally because, you know, like God removes himself, you know, to kind of see, is he there? And so structurally would like, instead of God and good, be like everything in slack. And then you would have, instead of life, you would have anything. So anything is everything plus slack, but wisdom is being able to separate everything in slack. So like wisdom is this, this next level, you know, those next, instead of eternal life, you talk about wisdom. And it's about the mind. Then, then in terms of the heart, let's say um, you do, what are the conceptions possible? So, the ways of conceiving everything, like the wishes for everything, like God wishes for nothing, God is certain, God wishes for something, I mean, sorry, God wishes for nothing is self-sufficient, but we have needs, we have bodies with needs. God wishes for something is uh, certain, but we have minds with doubts. God wishes for anything is calm, but we have hearts with expectations. God wish wishes for everything is loving, but we have wills with values, you see. So what the, those are the wishes, and then the representations of slack, it could be increasing or decreasing. There's these identities. And then the, what is it? Um, oh, choices would be the uh, representations of the will. I'm sorry, the representations of the uh, anything. But goodwill. Okay, so the goodwill is the way to take the wishes and the identity. And like, so, it's, so the way to deal, like instead of wisdom, you'd be talking about goodwill on the level of emotions. And then on the highest emotions about unity. So like love is the unity of the representations of the structure of God, let's say the spirit. So you have, so love is like that. So instead of God, you talk about love. Instead of goodness, you talk about perfection. The human will, instead of, you know, life, you talk about the will. The human will loves the perfect, but God's will keeps them separate. God's will loves the imperfect, you see, so... So to realize, like, God's will is superior to humans' will in that sense. Like, should love the imperfect, not just the perfect. Le like, learn to love the imperfect, you see. So that's God's will. So it's, see, and this is all, like, the result of mechanical thinking, you see. And so this is, like, you can see, like, I didn't think of these things. You know, I got some of them, like, it took me, like, 20 years. I knew. Okay, so we ran out of time, and then we got back into the time. And so you can see how excited I am. And so, but I, but I, you know, it's credit to you and your um, familiarity with absolute truth. In this time, I was able to tell you more than Kirby will ever know in 20 years. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I didn't, wa I Kirby, didn't, watch the video. Shout out to you. <laughs> so. I didn't follow. I think, I think like something like 80 to 90% of it tracks. And then there's some yeah. of it that I'm like, Mm, I'm not so sure, you know, but the thing I'm hearing though is the you said there was a mechanical process by which you came to came to these truths. Is that right? Well, and so um it took me 20 years, like you know, so as a six-year-old child, I was saying, maybe you're not good, maybe you are good, but you know, the assumption is God is good. I mean, like that's but see, like 20 years later, it's like reading the gospel of John, you know, it's like engaging. And he has this weird algebra of thinking. Like, so there's four Gospels, and I use them all for different um, studies. So, for example, the Gospel of Mark, which seems like the least informative, but it's the most emotional. So I did a study of Jesus's emotions. Like, when is he afraid? <laughs> like, when is he disgusted? You see, and you can work backwards and figure out, like, what is his expectation and his expectations that we're all one, right? So things like, so this is a great Gospel. Uh, gospel of Mark was great for uh, the content of his um, sayings. So just like comprehensive, like, you know, what are the eight sayings of Jesus and content wise, let's say. Mm -hmm. The gospel of Luke was great in terms of goodness. Like, so for goodwill, like what are the eight directions of the good, you know? But gospel of John is like Jesus's best friend, just documenting how Jesus talked from his own point of view, mm -hmm. you see? So it's really trippy. It's really trippy because it's like algebra. Like he's talking in algebra, like the father's will, the son's will, blah, 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 blah. And just wondering like, what is he? So I just like work to 
change like what is the algebra what is the logic like what is code like an example would be what does the son of man mean like so a child a child does as the father like the the child frog does like the mother frog let's say right but the son doesn't just do what the what the father or mother does the son is taught you see that's the difference between being a son like so the son so the son of god is taught by god's example but the son of man is made an example of by man you see so when if you're good you're going to get punished for it so if you're the son of man you're going to be lifted up as an example ha 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 you know you goody two shoes <laughs> you know so so when you talk about son of man i think that's about it like, see so this is a weird like algebraic you know kind of conclusion you know just like what is he talking about and so that but anyway so after that i finally got up the courage and uh living on the margins living you know i've always been blessed but like living with people who like my friend lost his home you know like living with people like and just realizing, like, every time I'm a good person, there's a chance I'll get punished for it. Um, mm -hmm. That's the logic of the world. So, and the chance I couldn't think, you know, things can work out very well. So, but there's a, you know, it, it's something weird about the logic of being good. So, uh, anyways, so I was able to see. So, when you load in, uh, you kind of match up, the you know, you, you read these structures. You ask, what are they, purpose do they serve? You look for additional evidence, you know, in the Holy Scriptures or in, you know, these divine minds, you know, like obviously, like my mind can introspect six things. So how can like somebody come up with this eight line thing? It must be godly because my mind can't do that. Like it's my mind cannot imagine a house with eight rooms and, you know, put them all in the. No, I can be familiar with eight rooms, but I can't. So it feels like intuition, you know, like just for intuition, you only need eight rooms because the mind is only like six rooms big. So, so I can model intuition, you know, it's very cool. So these structures, anyways, I, I digress. But, but the point being that, um, so when you do this mechanical chart, like I was kind of reading through, like you figure out, oh, God does not have to be good, you know, but then you say, oh, well, what's what's structurally going on? I know what God is structurally. I know what, see, and then you start to work out, oh, like, what are the, you know, representations? Oh, what are the unities? So, for example, this equation, God loves the imperfect, I figured out mechanically. But that's a very cool insight, I think, like, that's a, that's a divine insight, but I got it by plugging in the equations. So that's why I like this philosophy. See, so that's as best as I'm going to get in terms of absolute truth, right? Like, you know, like I got this super powerful language. So then like, why am I talking about the language, right? Like, so, so you're right. It's not about the language. I, I don't feel godly enough to talk about the, you know, to be going like, you know, Jesus or Buddha and talking about the content. I'm just saying, look, well, I think the point is that, and this is maybe the kingdom of heaven, the, the godliness of the Holy Spirit. Like if we had a, a holy language, if we had a holy culture, a holy civilization, like you should do your own testimony. I don't have to give testimony to you. You know the language. You have your experience. Put it together, right? Like, do you see what I'm saying? It's not for me to tell you, you know, the divine truth. I mean, I can tell you, but, you know, it's for you to kind of take your testimony and express it in the, you know, have the language help you. Is that So I think that's a nice, uh, but maybe just to conclude my little digression, say, wow, like, if, if that's, uh, so like, if there's like a way to, connect, let's say, with a whole Buddhist civilization that could be uh, in some ways uh, engaging, you know, that's a huge win. Especially in a world, you know, that's so relativistic now and kind of claims, let's say, a Buddhist world as like a excuse to be relativistic. <laughs> Do you know, like in terms of how it developed West, like, because I think that's one of the reasonings would be, oh, like, well, you know, um, you know, right. But it turns yeah, out that's an it's a bit of an abuse, I think. Part I mean, it's understandable that there's right, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting to um, I appreciate you kind of delineating your path, your pathway mm -hmm. to truth, being very analytical, right. being very much trying to think things through, find patterns, really study scripture, but also mm -hmm. investigating. The workings of your own mind right and also looking out at the world for for evidence but it seems like it's all it's the path you're laying out is is this very like it's kind of thinky it's kind of like it's very thinky like, right it's very like there's structure there's logic there's a 
this 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 left brain sort of approach to wisdom. Yeah, and um, I appreciate you working that out for yourself and trying to help others do something similar if they're inclined to that. And uh, I, I definitely have to say for myself that I take the other approach. I take mm -hmm. the mystical approach. Oh, okay. I take the approach of direct realization through just clearing everything away that mm. isn't that isn't true that isn't um you know well then there's a i mean me met methodically like in terms of method like it basically ends up being the having to be that you know in the sense that like to be able to throw away everything in the world and throw away everything in myself and just like focus on this abstraction oh. you know well, so i mean for me it's, it's focusing on the breath for instance oh yeah but for me it's not right breath. but yeah it's not for you but yeah. it's it's interesting these two different approaches and i appreciate you working on yeah it's them. curious like where they if where they could diverge or or but where they i don't know maybe and so maybe at this point it's something also like maybe if it would help to engage the community you know or other communities I could try to do a little bit of pra basic, you know, baby practices and things like the meditation stuff. Just partly, maybe not first of all for myself because I have my own, you know, but but just for the sake of trying to uh, be able to translate back and forth. And then, of course, I would learn something right. in the process. I'd probably be surprised, you know. Right. But uh, and I think uh, very like uh, it'll be. We'll find out in Onianta what Josh was doing. But there, and you, when you will be there, but I would not be completely surprised if there'd be a chance to sneak away for one or two of us to sneak away to Vermont, you know, if if we could. <laughs> well, do you see, like, to relate right. to say, hey, you know, in preparation right. for what you know, as, yeah, as yeah. emissaries or like to say, like for example, like to say, hey, I connected with you. Uh, I realized that there's a chance to uh, see if I could understand Buddhism better. Let's say right or meditation better. Maybe that would help me bridge with this whole world of people, right? Mm -hmm. So to do that before you come, possibly do that after you come, you see. Yeah, and so I think great. that that seems, uh, that seems, uh, at least I can suggest that. Yeah. Well, we'd have to figure out. Uh... Um, I don't have like, of course, a, much of a, I probably have enough money to get there or to get back. I don't have money to much to control, well, maybe like for basic food or something, you know, I don't have a lot to, uh, in terms of contribution, but also I could maybe offer like if it would, it's summertime, but, but uh, if there's interest like to have, if I can be utilized in some way, you know, like to have, uh, you know, we'll get, we could work something out, but. Um, yeah, let's maybe look at some of the other questions that you had mm -hmm. in case you want to go over anything. Yeah, maybe I bring them up. And just but just to say, I think that's kind of exciting, this phase two in terms of, oh, now I can do it because, you know, it would have been crazy if I would have just gone out, had this crazy idea. I'm going to try the Buddhists. <laughs> you know, like, you know, but now, like, because now that I people can see what it's about, it's easier to connect. Do we see my screen? Yes, I see it. I have to get there, I think, somehow. You see it, right? Right, I see but, it. But but so now it's easy to make... Like, I'll give an example of... Um, I think that this can be appealing to people on the margins, especially like when you're absolute truth. So an example would be like someone I connected with um, was uh, an African uh, who is uh, finishing the defense of his PhD in physics, super smart in all kinds of areas of math. And he's going to give a talk to us... Uh, and so uh, his name is um, Francis, uh, I'm sorry, Francis Howard. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I think, so here's like someone, you know, he he's likes to think about God, you know, and and, and so he, he, he's super um, self-independent in the sense that he's able to um, um, study such high level stuff on his own and now he's looking for a postdoc in a in some other west let's say you know europe or america or wherever but i think i would say like he's a person on the fringe and mm -hmm. someone like that can be so what is the fringe and i think that's a very jesus type of approach like who are all the people on the margins mm -hmm. that's the people we want 
because the people who are successful and in the center and whatever. But also another person was like Dr. Carl Fr Friston. Uh, he's uh, of the free energy principle, you see. And so he uh, is like one of the most cited neuroscientists, like tens of thousands of people. Also kind of on the fringe intellectually, like people like, what is this crazy idea? But uh, he's, a, and it's kind of maybe Buddhist, like in terms of this learning, um, how can I say, that perception goes into the mind and action goes out and that they kind of like uh, monkey with each other, you know, that's his basically whole thing. He models that mathematically and kind of shows the importance of that, that it's not just one way. It's like that you move because like you make the truth you believe in, <laughs> kind of like that type of thing, or, you right, know, right. you yeah, see right. what you choose to see, you know, those types of things. Right. So I would, you know, I'm sure that in Buddhism that comes up. But so I asked him, uh, see this, whether, what, how, why, I turned to connect to that. I found in mathematics, in category theory, I showed like where that comes up in math. So it's like a very good technical result. I mentioned it to him. He wasn't aware of this unit lemma because he gave a talk. Um, but he said he he had an expert on it, you see. And the expert was very complimentary of my work. And so, you know, he introduced me to a person. So all of a sudden, like this guy, probably has like 80 people working on his team or whatever, you know, but kind of looked at me with respect very quickly. Whereas like other people, I could try to talk to them for years. They're just never going to see what I see. And so certain people, they're just going to click. And mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know why I feel compelled to to say this, but it's, I kind of have a warning for you. Oh, <laughs> Basically, oh, good. I, I'll this, accept it. <laughs> this path of, so this path that you're on, which is uh, wonderful and seems potentially quite beneficial to many people. I just want to say that there is people on that path. You have to realize the mind can think literally any thought. Like it's, um, it's like, mm -hmm. and most thoughts are not true thoughts. Mm -hmm. So you have to have some connection, some way to really be connected to the truth because it's so narrow. It's, there isn't a lot of wiggle room in a way for just like any old thought or any well, old so what's theory. The, so what's the warning? Is that the warning or is there another warning? The warning is basically just whoever's on the path that you're presenting you have to have a lot of integrity. It's not just, this warning is not just for you, but it's for everyone who listens to you. It's for yeah. everyone who walks the same path as you. You have to have so much integrity. Um, and, it, and you have to also understand the limits of internal logical consistency. Because well, and, if you and, just uh, aim for internal logical, I'm not saying that you are doing this, but I'm saying that mm. anyone who tries to walk this path and believes deeply in some kind of internal logical consistency in their framework. That's, I mean, girdles in completeness theorem already kind of showed like that that doesn't work out. Um, well, okay, so maybe to, just, yeah. I mean, you you know you're speaking very intelligently and kind of with in in very fully. Um, so as an organizer of this uh, Easy Independent Thinkers, one of the things I learned was to ask for their deepest value in life. You know, I can ask, like, what's your deepest value in life, which includes all of your other values. And so mine is living by truth, you know, and they're all unique. But so, so it's exactly what you were saying. And what it ends up being, um, and it's, of course, absolute truth, not my personal truth. But what that ends up saying is that um, to be that person of integrity, you know, that's what it implies, you know, that I have to, in order to find the truth, I have to really work on my own internal consistency. And then I can appreciate the inconsistency of like the whole big picture. So what you like, so there's these scopes, like in the scope of everything, all things are true. <laughs> like in God's mind, you know, everything's because it's all kind of meaningless. Anyways, you know, it doesn't, there's nothing to latch on to. He can make anything true, you know, but then there's truths about there's a situation where like, well, anything is true. Like, you know, like kind of like about a medicine, right? Like, you know, like, like any medicine is, you know, good for you, but like, so some medicine is good for you. Then it becomes much more specific, right? Like then like no medicine good for you. Like, well, see when you get it to the scope of nothing, 
that's when you have like the very hard, you know, true and false. But those are systems where they're scope of nothing, like they have no meaning in a certain sense, because it's like just a formal system, right? Like, oh, okay. so yeah, I, we're I, usually I, in the middle somewhere. Yeah, we got we to gotta disambiguate. It's, this is this is very hard to talk about, I'm noticing. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to like be clear about it. So um, in the world, let's, I have a friend who calls this like the astral plane, just like the plane of all possibilities, of right. all possible ideas, concepts, um, truths, everything is true on this astral plane. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I just want to point out that that whole thing we're describing right now, that is itself just an idea. And it's just an idea that there is such a thing as like everything is possible or everything is true on some level, or there are many, you know. Well, so maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but the claim would be like, that's an absolute idea. Like that's an idea that can be expressed and that exists and resides in the language of absolute truth in the language of wisdom. Now, of course, it can be we can it can lead us astray. We can get confused about it, you know, etc. But it exists, so to speak. You know, like I mean, there, something like that exists in this yeah, language. Interesting. I As opposed to a that... tomato, you know, tomato doesn't really exist in the language of absolute truth. It doesn't make you know. I mean, it's just a. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay, okay. I I think it's helpful to to go. Yeah. So. See, like that can be seen in the wrong place. It can be, you know, it can lead someone astray. It can cause somebody to kill somebody yeah. or kill themselves. But, okay. but it's well, real yeah. in a certain sense. You know, it's not, guess, it's not a fiction. I like, whereas like, the idea I of a tomato is kind of like fictional. But I'll yeah. just speak to myself then. I'll just speak for myself. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as as far as I know, um, that's that that sense of there being like all like, that that thing that you can describe using the language of wisdom as you put it to me that's still basically just an abstraction and abstractions are not well maybe maybe to they're, point not, to they're not necessarily grounded in anything i guess maybe to um and i think maybe this is fair and so this is i think like you bring it to a very interesting point for me at least uh where um uh, this is kind of like an assumption that I have that could be wrong, but the idea, but this is kind of like the whole point of living by truth is that like, if I am devoted to truth, and I respect, you know, absolutely like this whole language of truth, then my, the spirit will flow in me without a problem. That's not my problem. See, so one way to like a very practical way that comes up is like, goodwill and the good heart. So like there's seven ways of showing goodwill. My father had this beautiful saying, like, always show goodwill. It's a very helpful, practical saying. Because, you know, it's like give somebody a little bit slack, you know, this way. You don't have to give them a lot, but just a little bit here, a little bit there. Always show goodwill. But you see, the goodwill is not kind of good on its own. The goodwill, it opens the way for the good heart. So like if, if you know, there's a good heart emanating from you, you know, just by the fact that you, I mean, you, you, you respond to my call, you know, that, you know. So God is coming through you, and maybe God is coming through me, hopefully, you know, in some ways. But what I'm doing is not emanating God. What I'm doing is keeping that channel open. So by being, by just focusing on that language of truth and just, you know, being a servant in that temple of truth, you see, the spirit will flow, and it's not my problem. And that'll be maybe in some sense like my spirit, because it was the spirit that flew through my portals in my temple. But big deal. Like you know, it's not about that anyway. So it's actually helpful, like just to focus on the language of truth. If I want to be part of the godly, you know, spiritual community. Yeah. I, I, I encourage you. See, so you. it's 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 the I warning is you. the warning is correct, but see, from a practical point of view, it doesn't seem like a what well, the assumption is. The assumption is that it, that seems to be the least of the worries. Um, but given that I keep checking to say, is there more there? Am I hiding something? You know, am I yeah. hiding something that's actually, or am I yeah, saying the whole thing? I think practically the actual thing is be grounded in goodness mm -hmm. in actually doing good and living a good life. Um, I think that's, that's a hard one for modern people to see or, or mm -hmm. sort of, sort of take on faith is that truth and goodness are deeply intertwined and not mm -hmm. separable 
and that the more good things you do with this life, with your actions, that truth actually becomes more accessible to those who uh, actually do good. It, it, and they, and it the idea is that the idea is that kind of like uh, spawns. I want to say is that like so for me practically like so good ends up being like this commitment to truth like you know like if i'm not good i'm not committed to truth like good is the way that i commit to truth and so like the kind of thing jesus would so you can see like i'm kind of a, i'm a fan of jesus like the kind of thing he said like you know it's not the superstar things i do that are going to be important to god it's like do i do the good that any good person could do you know do i comfort the old lady do right. i uh, pick up the trash you know do i yeah. whatever it is you know like do i shut up and just like let someone be you know those are all things anybody could do and do i do them you know yeah. so not that i'm the best swimmer in the world or whatever mm -hmm. so uh, so one, that's goodness. And then the second thing about goodness is that it's this humbling thing. It's like goodness is a very earthly thing, a very grounding thing. It's not a godly thing in the sense of like the big God beyond, you know. Good is our concern by which we humble ourselves to say that's our problem. You know, th that's not, that's our problem that kind of shows our humility before God in a certain sense to say, you know, God, God doesn't have to be good. You know, God can deal with these but the goodness of a kind of more that's not playing God, you know, because once people do good by playing God, you see, then that's, of course, evil in a certain sense, I guess, you know, where you say, oh, we're going to have to wipe out this. We're going to have to wipe out yeah. that. Right. Like, well, that's not good. Maybe, uh... <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Maybe I know I'm taking I, I mean, I have plenty of time, but I think that we wow, you got a lot out of me. So this will be a very fun uh, thing to record. And then maybe we, you know, once a week, you know, when you're free, let's say, you know, I can see that you you have the keys to my heart. Um, maybe in closing, and then also like I like to end with a prayer. So I think you have no shortage of ways of praying, right? That you would end this out with a prayer. But before we do that, like anything more, maybe suggestions um, for me, or uh, you this you gave the beautiful suggestion of visiting in Vermont. I think that mm -hmm. that deserves to be yeah. real. Anything? Any other th parting thoughts? No, just keep keep doing what you're doing, and I appreciate your work, and um, I appreciate your a certain s strength of character. I see, and in in thank you integrity integrity in um what you're doing, and I you know doing this work is hard. It's as you say, lonely it can be lonely. So um, thank you. Yes. And you you make it not lonely. I appreciate that. You know, I'm very deeply thankful for you and for you know being with me, but being with all of us. You know, being with Joshua, a friend, I think, to Joshua in this because it's exciting. So I will add to our prayer, like uh, just a prayer for Joshua, uh, for his leadership, for his learning, because he really wants to grow in this. Uh, so he has all these opportunities that he really appreciate the value of that. And that we be inspired by his growth and we kind of take that opportunity and that we kind of like be responsive to the dynamic of the spirit of like, well, what happens in our mix together? So and maybe also the surrounding community, like, you know, what's this whole I don't know if it's the cat skills, but like, what's this whole thing that we'll be part of, you know, yeah. grooving? Um, and then, um, yes, yeah, so I thank you. So please then. Uh, Pray for us. So I'm actually, um, this will not be in English. I'm going to do a, a chant in Tibetan. Um, mm. That is a prayer for the um, bringing about and fully developing and spreading um, on and on this heart of compassion that strives for uh, the liberation of all beings. So that's the prayer is just um, to the prayer is that this aspiration will continue to flourish. Yeah. I'll just do this um, chant and um, please listen. Chang tube sang chok 
Tim Poche Makye Panam Kyegyurchi Kyepanyam Pa Me Payam Gong Ne Gong Du Hai 